Hello, and welcome to Wednesday at Bear Branch, a virtual ministry of the Churches of Christ. We are now rebroadcasting the study of the fourfold gospel compiled by Brother J. W. McGarvey, taught by Brother Brian Barrett, who preaches for our congregation here at Bear Branch in Spurlockville, West Virginia. We hope that you will find the lessons profitable in the study of God's Word and enlightening to the Christian walk. Brother Barrett has been a preacher and teacher in the Churches of Christ for over 40 years, a frequent speaker in gospel meetings, revivals, having worked in TV and radio, and now our internet ministry. You may obtain a copy of Brother J. W. McGarvey's The Fourfold Gospel at our website, www.thechurchesofchrist.life, on our Fourfold Gospel page. You may use either the online copy or download the volume from this site, both are free to use. We now invite you to open your Bibles and the fourfold gospel. Follow along in our lesson of the hour. Now, here's Brian. When I was uh, in school, uh, one of the classes that we had to do was a study of the life of Christ. Now, that seems logical that if you're going to study theology, that you probably ought to throw in the life of Christ somewhere along the way. And so part of that was, in studying the life of Christ, was uh, to take a parallel uh, material and to put the Gospels back in chronological order. And so that's what uh, Brother J.W. McGarvey has done. Uh, Brother McGarvey served the church in the latter part of the 1800s, the early part of the 1900s. Uh, he was a... a uh, a well-known speaker, teacher, uh, gospel minister. And so uh, he came out, he, he and uh, Brother Pendleton, which I'm really not familiar directly with him, but I know J.W. McGarvey because of his writings. So <clears throat> as, we, as we do this, I want to talk a little bit you, know, you don't have to have the book in order to follow along with us, kind of. But without the book, it's going to get kind of confusing because you're going to have to keep jumping from place to place to place to place. Sometimes there may be several verses in a particular book and chapter that we're going to be dealing with. But sometimes as all of these chronologically uh, are put together, we're going to be bouncing from book to book to book and back to the book and, and on and back and forth and back and forth. And so that's why, you know, I, I wanted to use uh, the book and we could follow along with the work that uh, Brother McGarvey did. Now, I want to make a couple uh, statements as we uh, begin here. Uh, it's going The text is going to seem a little bit different to some of you because uh, Brother McGarvey uh, always, uh, or at least most of the time, used the American Standard Version of 1901. And his material and his works are based around that translation. It's not my favorite. I think everybody here pretty much knows what my favorite is. But uh, for the sake of making this study work, we're going to be uh, dealing with the American Standard Version 1901. That's what is incorporated into the text that uh, Brother McGarvey uh, put here. So there may be some uh, differences uh, between the King James, if you're following along King James or whatever, from uh, the American Standard. But there's not uh, a great deal of, of difference uh, necessarily in uh, that. As we enter into using the uh, material, uh, if you have the book or if you have uh, looked online, uh, I put a thing on the church website or the church notice on, on, uh, on Messenger. I added another page to our website, which has uh, the top link will take you directly into the study guide. If you're just wanting to read something, you can d use the top link and go into the study guide. You don't save anything in there. But if you're using, like I am, uh, 
Uh, I have downloaded it on my desktop. It's on my laptops. It's on my iPad. It's on my uh, iPhone, I think. But, you know, I've, I've pretty much put this on everything. So if you want to download that onto your iPad or whatever, uh, there is a link there that you can push that's, that either has a down arrow uh, or it says download. And if you click on that, it will download the version that I'm using here uh, on my iPad. But if you choose to download it, you're going to have to save it into a file somewhere. If you hit download and it brings it up, you're only halfway there. If you go back out of that, you're going to lose it. So if you're dealing with an iPad, you need to, there's a, in the top of your iPad, there is a place that you can send it to a file and make a file on your iPad to store it in a file on the iPad itself on uh, a, uh, a Windows computer uh, when you get to the PDF, which is the type of file it is, there's a little disk up at the top and you can click on that and then save it somewhere on your computer. So uh, if you had it, I don't know if anybody's actually, I see a few maybe they're trying to use iPad or whatever. If you were on there at home and you got here tonight and all of a sudden you can't find it anywhere, that's because you didn't save it. So uh, you were probably using the internet at home and everything looked pretty at home, but once you backed out of it, it wasn't saved. And so it's just like when the power goes off, it's now on some uh, IBM or, or uh, Windows computers, it may still be in a download file if you want to go and look in there, but you need to specifically move it into a file. Does anybody have any questions on any of all, or all of that? I know there's a lot there. But we're just kind of getting started tonight. So what we're going to have is uh, Brother Garvey has taken Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with a couple other things, and he has put those in, in chronological order uh, to the best of his knowledge. Now I'll say that. There are certain points and places in the life of Christ that scholars disagree which happened first and which happened after that. And as we know, when you're reading the Gospels, you know, they tend to bounce around a bit and they may go from the end of one chapter and start another chapter. But if you really look at it between the end of that chapter and the first of this one, there's stuff in the other Gospels that took place at the same time. So what Brother McGarvey did is put all of that as best he could uh, into a chronological order. And so we're basically dealing with one Gospel. Uh, that's the book is entitled The Fourfold Gospel, uh, and it is a study of that. And so you, you, we basically have what it amounts to is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put together uh, in a chronological order. And so we basically start, as we're going to see tonight, we're going to start with Jesus before his birth and things that happened before his birth in the Gospels that is discussed. And then we will move into the birth of Christ and, and just keep going until we reach uh, the, the end where, of course, Jesus goes back uh, into heaven. You will also find that uh, one of the things that Brother uh, McGarvey did and, and the other brother as they were working on this is that they have also inserted commentary uh, within the pages. The Bible text is in bold type. And so if you're just interested in reading the Bible text, it's the text that's in the bold type. And so you can just read the bold type and you get the text in chronological order. But he also put commentary in there, which is not in bold type. And so not only are you getting the uh, scriptures in in his view of the chronological order, but you also have now a commentary that helps you understand some of the more difficult uh, verses. And so that's incorporated into that also. And so I know the book cost, uh, I don't know, it's it's what, $29 or something like that? How much? 20 
So for $20, you're getting the chronological study of the life of Christ. You're getting a commentary. You're getting several different things. Along the way, you will from time to time, in order to save space, rather than using Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and using that in all the different places, sometimes you will see that the notation in the book will be A and then a chapter and a verse, or B, chapter and a verse, or C, chapter and a verse, D, chapter and a verse. And I think you can probably figure it out, but Matthew is A, Mark is B, Luke is C, and John is D. And so that's just another way of saving a little bit of space in the book from not having to always say uh, that it's coming from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as we're bouncing around, but the notation will be there. In addition to all of that, you know, again, I'm not trying to sell the book, but I mean, you can get it free off the, the website. But in addition to that, and in the commentary part, you're going to find a wealth of other scriptures that cross-reference all over the place in the Old Testament, the New Testament. And so when we're dealing with prophecies, when we're dealing with various aspects of the life of Jesus uh, and how it applies to uh, the old law, the, the new law uh, event that's mentioned there, you'll find sometimes two, three, four other verses uh, that are included in the commentary to send you. Uh, and so if you've used a a reference Bible, you know that there are from time to time in the sides, the end of the verse, whatever, various uh, references that send you somewhere else. So this Bible, uh, this book is also a reference Bible because it will, as you're looking at those verses, send you uh, to other verses, which you can or cannot study. It's all up to you. I'm not going to necessarily follow all of those trails as we go through here. Our primary emphasis is going to be on, on trying to keep the chronological study going. But as we go along, obviously there will be things that need to be discussed and these uh, interpretation of what Jesus meant or whatever along the way. And so if you're using the uh, computer version, you will see that the computer version has those uh, scriptures highlighted in a different color. It comes out in blue in mine, and I'm, I'm going to assume that if you have a... Do what? Black. Uh, some of... of uh, uh, but but some of these these references, the cross-references, may that if they have a color, it's linked. Uh, when we get down further in here, you may see the blue. Uh, but... If you click on that, if, you, if you're looking in the book, you're going to have to take your Bible out and, and turn to those pages. But if you're using a computer, if you click on that, it will take you to uh, a, a, uh, that particular verse. It may, again, not always be in the King James, but you know that's, that's up to you how you want to uh, follow that. So there, there's... Uh, references in here, there's commentary in here, there's the chronological aspect of it here. Uh, and so this is something that, you know, I've really wanted to do for probably the last 30 years. I just never uh, took the time to do it. Uh, and I think it's something of value because even though we study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we usually do them sequentially. And so by the time we get to uh, John, we forgot about what is going on in Matthew. And so this way, we're just going to start at the beginning and we're going to go to the, to the end, uh, Lord willing, uh, as we journey along. And so with that, uh, we kind of have, I think, all of the uh, comments that I wanted to make. The, the one that uh, downloads on the uh, website. I try to, to, to figure out, and I, I can't. I guess because of the file size, uh, generally, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good size file. And so to keep it at a smaller file, the pages 
are on the computer part, it's, it's a two page view. And so each page that you see here, there's a column on the left and a column on the right. And those two pages are going to work together and then you scroll down to the next set of pages. So you're getting two pages at a time uh, to save the, the file and size that's in here. All right, each section or part of Jesus' life has been broken down. Uh, we have a list <clears throat> of some of those things in the introduction and in the comments. Brother uh, McGarvey at the start here, he, he lists part one, part two, part three, part four, and he goes on in various parts of Jesus' life. And so he's, he's grouped some of those things together. I'm not going to go into great detail with that now because we're going to be going into the specifics of it and we're going to go uh, from the beginning. So I would encourage you wherever you're at to go to the first part, whatever page that is. I know the one on the internet is page six, but I have no idea what page it is. Some of you who are on the other one. It starts part the part first period of Christ's life prior to his ministry. And it says Luke's preface and dedication, Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. That's where we're at. It's the starting part. Everybody with us? Okay. So this is in the beginning of the study. Uh, we're going to be looking in, in uh, Luke's commentary that he makes about the life of Christ. Uh, in uh, Luke uh, 1, beginning verse 1, it says, For so much as many have taken in hand to draw up a narrative concerning these matters which have been fulfilled among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word. As we look at the, the beginning part here, uh, Luke makes some uh, comments that uh, we, we want to think about in a chronological sense. Uh, it's not fully understood what Luke means uh, as many. For so much as many have taken in hand to draw up a narrative concerning these things. Now we're familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because that's part of the New Testament. Uh, obviously Luke hadn't been written when he was writing this. Uh, he's just writing Luke now. So that means that at best there probably was Matthew and Mark and John may have very well wrote his even later, so that would only put uh, Matthew and Mark uh, as something perhaps that was written uh, than he is. So where the many are, and he is, I mean, he says it, the Holy Spirit uh, states it, and perhaps there are many who made various comments and wrote about some of the things which Jesus did, and those things have not all uh, been brought into the Scripture or even known uh, along the way. And, and in a way, that's kind of sad, but at the same time, uh, we can only read and study so much. And so uh, John acknowledges <clears throat> in his uh, writing that Jesus did many things in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in that book, and he supposed that if everything was written that could be written, uh, the world couldn't contain all the, that, that needs to be written. And we've been writing commentaries and books and studies on these things from the very beginning. And so how this was, who wrote these things down, uh, what became of those writings, uh, some of them perhaps who uh, witnessed the things concerning Jesus made uh, some notes of their own about that. Some of those may not necessarily even been under the direction of the 
Holy Spirit. Some of them may have made personal writings of some of the things that they saw and some of the things that they heard and some of the things that they uh, were dealing with in, in their lives. But nonetheless, uh, he speaks about the fact that uh, they have delivered into us the things which took place uh, from the beginning. They were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and saw the fulfillment of the things which uh, were written. And so Luke kind of launches us off uh, into a, a, a thought about the fact that uh, we have uh, various points uh, of fulfillment from the various eyewitnesses. And of course, the ones that we're interested in in this particular study is going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the ones who we think of as inspired writers. There have been over the years other writings that have uh, shown up. And there were other writings that people were aware of uh, in the early church. And when the Bible's canon was put together, uh, many of those various writings were left out because it was not believed that they showed uh, any inspiration. They were just merely observations which were made uh, by men. And so that may be some of the ones that Luke is in reference to. I'm not for sure. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we have that information. Any questions, comments, anything about... Yes? Yeah. Uh, he's talking about the... American Standard. I think I have an American Standard at home. Would that be uh, sufficient for the, for the class? Well, again, like I said, you're going to have to jump back and forth because we just now did Luke verse 1 through 4, and now we're going to jump over to John 1. So we're, we're going to be jumping around all over the place. The, the American Standard's not in chronological order, it's in the same order as the others. So Luke kind of jumps, telling us that many has, have tried to put together an, an understanding of the things which uh, they were witnesses of and that they knew of. John, uh, one of the associates of Jesus, and we've been studying that book on Sunday morning, uh, going over to John, the first chapter, uh, we have those familiar statements there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that hath been made. In this was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness that he might bear witness to the light that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came that He might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, even the light which lighteth every man. Coming into the world, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world knew Him not. Uh, and so Luke tells us that people have uh, various people have put together uh, a, a account of the life of Jesus. And so if we're going to chronologically uh, study the life of Christ, we understand that Jesus Christ did not begin as that little baby in Bethlehem, right? You know, then if we're studying chronologically uh, who Jesus was and what Jesus did, John tells us that you know in the beginning was the Word, and that Word, of course, was Christ. And he talks about the creative process of Jesus, which was there. And so uh, if we're going to deal with the life of Christ, we have to understand that in the beginning, Christ was there. Uh, Christ was alive. Uh, one of the phrases that we looked at not so long ago on Sunday morning is that Jesus used the statement, 
uh, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And so he used that same phrase that God used when speaking to Moses uh, about the title or the name of God. Uh, and so Jesus referenced there, and the Jews caught that. They thought it to be blasphemy, but they caught that. But John, uh, the apostle, speaks here about the coming of Jesus. And we have the fact that the world uh, was made by Him, uh, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so uh, when we think about Jesus and we think about the events that take place there, uh, John very clearly uh, expresses the fact that if we're talking about Genesis 1 and following on, Anything that Genesis 1 describes, anything that God did, all the way from, you know, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep all the way up until the fact that God created man and woman. Uh, he breathed into their nostrils a breath of life and, and Adam, and he took uh, a rib and from the side of Adam made woman. And so all the way from taking a, uh, a world uh, that was somewhat chaotic and in darkness and refining it all the way up to the creation of man and woman, Jesus had a part uh, in all of that. And so when we're chronologically looking at the life of Jesus, uh, we rightly need to understand that He was God. He was there in the beginning. He was part of God. He was with God. And he was God. Now, there are some religions that teach that Jesus is not God. Uh, I mean, they're in the Christian type faith. They believe that Jesus was not God. And as I have read and studied, one of those uh, is the Jehovah Witness. As I understand, they believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. But that's not what John says. John says that Jesus was there in the beginning and he was created. He was with God and he was God. So he's not an angel. He's not a powerful angel. He's God. Yes. Do they have, I thought you wondered about them. Do they have their own Bible? Yes. Somebody read another Bible for them? Yes. The yes, they, they have the watch. Uh, yes. I also believe that they're living here in. Uh, right here. Yeah, that that we will inherit the earth. Yeah, the righteous will inherit the earth. And so, uh, you know, there there are various reasons why people need to understand. Uh, if we're not reading, if we're not studying the scriptures, uh, and somebody else tells us, and that's why I'm not really excited about a lot of translations because you just never know, you know, what all. Uh, for the sake of getting the copyright that they've done. Uh, and, you know, the, the scriptures and, and where they're getting them from and, and what scrolls they're coming off of, uh, the received text versus some of, of the various other texts that are used. We've we talked about that uh, before. But uh, Jesus was there in the beginning, was with God, He was God. Uh, he came into the world and the world knew him not. And so we will get a view of that as we go through John. We're seeing that. Uh, I don't know if many in some of the cases it was that they didn't know him or they didn't want to know him. They didn't want to recognize who Jesus was. But as we go down to the to to the next page of verse, it's distinct. Somebody has something? Yes, yes. Those apostles who were there from the beginning of the ministry of one of the things, and, and this is why sometimes I, you know, that it to be an apostle, as we see in Acts, the first chapter. To have been selected as an apostle, you had to be uh, a witness from the preaching of John the Baptist, from the 
baptism of John all the way up to the time that Jesus was taken up into heaven. And so that's the, the in that sense, uh, we're talking about the beginning of Jesus' ministry as he was baptized. And that's what they came in Acts, the first chapter, when they try to find a replacement for Judas. Uh, they, they make sure that they get someone from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up. Because as I've said before, you can't be an eyewitness unless you're an eyewitness. Uh, that's the issue that I have many times. People say they want to witness for Christ. I can't witness for Christ. Well, well then, uh, Paul, Christ took him back to see all that. When he said he was born out in time. Yeah, um, there, there's been much discussion as to you know the life of Paul is somewhat shaded. He was brought up in the city of Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel which would imply that he was there when Jesus was teaching. That he was there in the city, a young man, when Jesus was there in the temple teaching and preaching, and he was a witness to whatever Gamaliel and all the others had to say about Jesus. He was there uh, he, because it says he was brought up he in the city. Follow, he? But he wasn't a direct follower of Jesus. But he may very well have been a witness of those things. However, he goes on to say in Galatians, the first chapter, that the gospel that he preached, he did not receive of men, neither was he taught it of men, but that he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. And there is a period of time after Paul's conversion until the time that Barnabas goes and gets him that is sort of a silent time, and it's quite possible that in that silent time, Jesus was making revelations and teaching and preparing him uh, to be an apostle. I mean, he made it clear on the road to Damascus that you know he was he was a chosen person for a specific uh, task that Paul that God had for Paul, and that was, of course. Taking the gospel into the Gentiles. Yeah. yeah, he was he was there. Again, here in verse eleven, John one, it continues by saying, "He came unto his own, uh, and they that were his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God." even to them that believe on His name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we have commented on those things in our Sunday morning lesson, but this... Uh, in this chronological order, we we just kind of need to to look at. And John's making some some comments here about uh, Jesus. Uh, and so as we uh, go on, it says John beareth witness of him, and Christ saying, "This is he of whom I said, He that cometh after me is become before me, for he was." Before me, for of his fullness we all received, uh, we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then here's one of those passages that I think uh, we need to. Uh, consider, and I always tell people there's there's certain things that are just, you know, just as much as we find that Jesus was in the beginning, was with God, and was God, uh, we have this statement here uh, that we need to mull over in light of what John is saying here. He says in verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So 
When it says no man, or in this case, no person, no man has seen God at any time, uh, does that mean just lately? You know, from what John's writing from the beginning of time, and by that we would go all the way back as far as man is concerned, man breathed in, or God breathed into man's nostrils a breath of life, and he became a living soul or living being. And God walked with him and talked with him and spoke with him in the garden. He gave him directions and he spoke to him face to face. You know, when he came looking for the man and the woman after the fall, he wanted to know, you know, where where were you? You know, you always used to come, you know, as soon as I appeared, you came looking for me. Now I had to come looking for you. And we're not going to go greatly into that. But nonetheless, that means that Adam, who saw God and spoke with God, did not see God the Father. And it goes on to say that it is the Son, which is Jesus, who is, at the time John was writing this, ascended back to heaven and is in the bosom of the Father or sitting on the right hand of God, as we know. It says, He hath declared Him. And so from the time that God visited the man and the woman in the garden, when He spoke with them, when they were cast out, when He appeared, uh, we're told that Enoch walked with God. Uh, and we're told that God, uh, He was not for God took Him. Uh, some people de debate whether He literally walked with God or if it's speaking in a figurative sense. But whatever, uh, God spoke uh, with Abraham and there are places where uh, we see the manifestation uh, three men. Uh, Abraham saw three men uh, walking one day about noon and Abraham went out and he, caught, he invited them to come and sit in the shade of his tent and to, to rest in the hot day. And as he begins to speak with these three men, the Bible begins to, to reveal to us that two of them are angels that he sends uh, to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to prepare it for destruction and to rescue those uh, who he promised could be saved uh, if, if they were willing. But then it, the third person stays there and converses with, with Abraham, and it's referred to as the Lord. The Lord you know, begins to talk with Abraham, and the Lord said to Abraham, and that's the third person. And so in all of those times in the Scriptures that we see God manifesting Himself in some physical way uh, in which uh, they uh, could see Him, uh, it is uh, through uh, the efforts of Jesus Christ making uh, those references. You know, wasn't, uh, I may be wrong about this, but wasn't he, wasn't he in the... When Daniel was in, was it Daniel in the Daniel was in the fiery furnace. They were they were cast into the to the fire, fiery furnace. Saw one likened to the Son of Man. Yeah, and it wasn't Daniel, but it was his three companions that were cast into the fire. But they saw a fourth one like unto the Son of Man, and so. It was either an angel or it may very well have been. When it says like unto the Son of Man, it just that phrase just basically means another human. We put three people in there, and I count four out of the three we put in there, and there's another person walking with him. And so that may have very well you didn't also. See God, you just think a shadow or an image of him, didn't you? Who's that? The, the yeah, you know, he he interacted with God and God, you know, God, you know, brought all the animals to him and he named them. It doesn't say that he just saw or heard a voice, but, you know, the idea that we get there in the beginning is God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, that God manifested himself literally in a physical uh, presence after the man and the woman's day. God would appear in the garden, you know, when they were at a period of rest. It's interesting he didn't interrupt their work. 
he let them do the task that was there. And then in the evening, as they were resting, he came to uh, fellowship. So we, when we talk about the life of Christ, we want to understand, you know, who he was before. You know, so many people, you know, they, they think about the little baby that was born and laid in the manger there in Bethlehem, and they see that as the start of Jesus. They see that uh, as His becoming the Son of God, and so they kind of think of that as the beginning. Now, of course, He was an, an infant and, and before He was born. He was in His mother's womb. We know that, but but they think of that as the time that when he was conceived and as he was born, they think that that's kind of the beginning of the account. But John tells us that the story is much richer than uh, we perhaps have ever thought about. Uh, and again, when we're doing this, we have to kind of approach it as if we've never heard this before. You know, sometimes when we approach a study, it's like, you know, I've, I've heard those verses ever since I was a little kid. Well, you know, as we approach this study and others, we need to approach it as if this is the first time we've ever heard that. And we need to think about what it's saying to us and what it's telling us uh, about who Jesus was and what he's done and what the gospel has to say to us. And when the word became flesh, that, that's kind of been enough to blow somebody's mind too. Yeah. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and it became flesh, of course, uh, as the child developed in his mother's womb. Uh, Jesus was there. Uh, as we go along, we'll see this, but you know, when Mary meets uh, her cousin Elizabeth, you know, the baby, which was John the Baptist, leaped in her womb when, he, when Mary was there, in essence, uh, uh, recognizing Jesus who was in his mother's womb. Yes, Paul? He went from a spiritual being. We worship in spirit and truth, right? Right. He went from a spiritual into a flesh womb. Right. You know, God is a spirit. And they that worship. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That doesn't mean that him and the Father are the same person, but you know, they have all the same attributes. You're not, you know, a lot of times people try, if especially if there's three, they try to play, as they say, both ends against the middle or whatever, uh, try to get an odd man out or to get the advantage. And what Jesus says there, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, is that, you know, though there are three distinct personalities, you're not going to get it. If you ask God the Father a question, you ask the Holy Spirit a question, and you ask Jesus a question about the same thing, uh, you're, you're only going to get one answer because there's, there's only one aspect uh, of which that can, can be really answered in. And so uh, the Word became flesh. As Paul says, we come from a, a point where He is a spiritual being to the point where He becomes flesh. And this is another important thing because in the early days of the church, doctrines arose uh, saying that Jesus did not really come in the flesh. He really wasn't a human being, but he was kind of more like an angel or something. He, you know, he, he was more than just a man. And so some tried to teach, you know, trying probably some of the first ones uh, trying to explain how he could resurrect. Uh, we're, we're trying to put forth the idea that, well, he never really was human to start with. He was sort of like an angel. And so, you know, he was crucified on the cross. And what they basically say is that he pretended to be dead uh, and he came back to life because you can't kill an angel. Uh, and so he came back to life. And so uh, there are those who were teaching that, uh, you know, he wasn't flesh and blood. But uh, in these early things, we uh, next week, our time's up for tonight. But, you know, as, as we get ready to go into uh, the third part of this section, we start getting into the genealogies of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, one of the things that scriptures tell us in Genesis, the third chapter, in the pr first prophecy concerning the Messiah was that there would be a redeemer, there would be a deliverer that would come of the seed of woman and that he would crush the head of Satan. Even though Satan would bruise his heel, he would crush his head. And so the genealogies of Jesus sort of tie up the Old Testament. They tie up the, uh, the answer as to coming of the seed of woman. And in these genealogies, we're going to see there's a genealogy in Matthew, there's a genealogy in Luke. And so in these genealogies, we're going to see that one of the genealogies has to do with Joseph, who was deemed uh, to be the father of Jesus. He was the man who adopted him and raised him, in essence, as his own son. And so we have a, a genealogy of Joseph, and adoption was a valid thing in, uh, in Israel as well as it is today, that when one is adopted, they're grafted in uh, to that particular family. And Matthew uh, shows us uh, one genealogy uh, through uh, Joseph. And then Luke will later show us a genealogy through Mary. And we'll see, you know, that sometimes they're running together and sometimes they, they separate. But uh, I'm, Matthew primarily, as we're going to look next week, is going to deal with the fact that Jesus came as a descendant of David in the fulfillment that uh, of David's loins or in his genealogy, he would raise up someone to sit on his throne. And of course, that is Jesus the Messiah. And the interesting thing about Luke's genealogy is he starts uh, with probably Mary's genealogy and Mary's father. And he runs that genealogy all the way back to Adam who was the son of God. And so there's this big circle in Luke's genealogy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God created man. He was the father of Adam. Adam didn't have a literal uh, physical father, but God is his father. And so if you trace that genealogy backwards, you start with Mary's side of the family and you trace that all the way back. So you start with God and you trace it all the way back to God. And so it makes a complete circle back onto the fact that uh, not only was Jesus flesh and blood descendant, uh, but he also uh, was God. So our time's up for this evening. Lord willing, next week we will pick up there in section three with the, the genealogy. Thank you again. For listening to the lessons today, we would encourage you to visit our website. For more learning opportunities, there is much to do and see. www.thechurchesofchrist.life May God bless you. Until we have time together again.